I thought I'd talk a little bit about how design can nudge social behaviour. And it's an area where we've been doing some experimentation over recent years. So I'm sort of seeing the conversation, our conversation today, and I, I really do hope that we can have some questions, so I'll try and be as quick as I can. Um, but I am seeing this very much in the spirit of sharing um, knowledge and taking some of our stories, and I hope that we'll get some feedback. And um, I should say up front that we are really delighted uh, to be partnering with the Danish Design Centre, and you'll see some of our stories, some of the artefacts and products in the exhibition downstairs. So some of the things that I'm going to talk about here are actually also downstairs in the exhibition. <laughs> now, the cynics among you are probably saying he's just shown us a picture of his dog because he wants to endear himself to the audience. Um, and the, perhaps the social psychologists among you those who've been picking up some of the terminology of behavioural science are saying he's using a priming technique. Um, you know, that experiment, which I always find I interesting, where um, they took, you take a bunch of people, you give them words to make sentences, like, and, and on the cards are words like fitness, active, healthy, um, and then you send that bunch of people into a building, and the interesting thing is that they tend to take the stairs, not the lift. Um, and, you know, why is this? Just in the same way as its scientists, social scientists, have proven that if you're going for a job, it's much better to offer a warm drink than a cold drink. It's a little, I mean, if you take nothing away from today, do take that away. Um, <laughs> Which is because actually, you know, we actually infer from the hot drink that, that maybe it's a more welcoming place. So this is interesting, you know, and, and what, but what relevance does it have? Well, of course, this is all to do with fundamentally how our brains work. And, you know, I'm sure many of you know we have um, a limbic system, this... Um, the, the much more intuitive uh, side of our brains, and a cognitive system, the deductive side, which um, we all like to think is what guides our decisions. That when we're going to buy a financial product, say, we'd be using our cognitive system. And of course, it's just not the way that human beings work. Um, we're very much guided by our limbic systems. Uh, in fact, there was an experiment in the States where they were marketing, they marketed financial products um, as a piece of social science. And they found, I'm afraid to say, sad as it may seem, that by putting a pretty woman on the front of exactly the same financial product, it made a very significant difference to the uptake of that financial product. So clearly, people were not looking at using their cognitive side. Now, I mean, here we are, you know, at a design conference. You know, what relevance does this have? Well, I think we've already been hearing some of this from our conversation today. I think that there are two sort of uh, confluent issues here. One is that people generally want more self-determination. This was, of course, a picture from earlier in the year in from the Arab Spring, when things actually looked even perhaps a bit more optimistic. But also that we have a huge and growing population. And of course, in a period of um, an economic downturn, then it's no surprise that politicians are looking at new ways to have an impact, to make change happen. And they're looking, of course, for ways in which maybe you can elicit pro-social behaviours that don't cost a lot of money. Um, perhaps you can actually nudge people towards those if they, you know, to uh, away from obesity and chronic disease towards more healthy eating. Um, to, you know, seven billion people is, of course, seven 
billion potential incidences of cirrhosis if people abuse alcohol, for example, or seven billion potential victims of crime. So as the problems amass, as the scale of the issue becomes so big in whatever field we've heard from so many different areas today, then the idea that maybe you can get under the skin of the issue and nudge and shift that social behaviour becomes more interesting. But where does design come in? Well, we've already been, I think, seeing some brilliant examples today. Um, but, of course, it's absolutely in the fibres of design. Um, shifts that one gets. The fruit-flavoured company that was referred to earlier um, succeeded in shifting 90 million people from brick phones onto smartphones, not by actually giving them a significantly different technology, because those technologies were already there, but by actually giving them little clues and ideas and actually intuitively getting under the skin of what we might indeed want and need. We called the project Design Bugs Out, and I'll give you a little example of some of the um, outputs, some of the results of that project. And as I said, some of these are actually downstairs. The project started much in the same way as we heard um, from GE, with observation. So sending design teams, particularly design research teams and ethnographers, into hospitals to have a look, to understand what was going on. Um, and as you can see, from just these three photographs that I've chosen from the ethnographic research, hospitals are very difficult to clean and difficult to keep clean. And so putting out routines and policies which say, do more deep cleaning, isn't necessarily the answer. Maybe we need new clues and new ways to support clean hospitals. So this led here... Um, one team, and I think it's important for me to point out here that we operate by opening up opportunities to many, many different organisations. So the idea here is to throw the net open and invite designers to work with manufacturers, but at the heart of the exercise, provide the opportunity for patients, nurses, um, and other people uh, who work within this whole arena to have an opportunity to contribute to that thinking. So I'll just give you one other example, a short case study as well of um, this. And this is in the area of alcohol abuse. And I found this, this is again from this year's statistics from the World Health Organization. And I find that a staggering statistic that 4% of all deaths worldwide, 4% of all deaths worldwide are attributed to alcohol. I mean, that, you know, you have to really let that sink in when you think of all of the other reasons for death. And 12% of that number is associated with intentional injury. So that's uh, of violence, sometimes domestic, and often in places where alcohol is consumed. It's an issue in the West, it's an issue the world over. In the UK, we talk about binge drinking. I'm not sure what that's called in Danish. Um, it must have a word, I'm sure. Or maybe it doesn't. You probably call it binge drinking because you look at us and say, why on earth are they doing that? But, um, but we took a look at this through a program that we established with the Home Office called Design Out Crime. And again, we went back to people who were both the perpetrators but also the victims of crime. And this is actually somebody who helped us in this study. Um, his name's Blake. And uh, Blake Golding was um, working as a doorman at a club and um, he had a glass shoved in his face. It's a very common injury. We ca they're called glassings. So the quandary, the, the, uh, the nub of the issue for policymakers was, do you legislate or do you innovate? 
because you could legislate and say, well, pubs and clubs that have these problems should use plastic glasses. We said, give it a chance for innovation. Once we'd refined that idea, we passed the project and the problem on to a design team. It was a company called Design Bridge. They came up with the idea of putting a bioresin on to the inside of glasses so that actually, at least if you can't prevent people from drinking, you can stop the glass from becoming a weapon. And I'm very pleased to say this was actually just a prototype design drawing. But um, only six or seven weeks ago, the product was launched by Europe's largest manufacturer of glassware, Arc, French company, um, and is being sold all around the world. <coughs> this is one of a number of projects of this nature that we've been running. Um, if you are interested in this sort of open innovation approach and how designers, manufacturers, technologists and people within uh, and policy makers can get together, we've got a number of them running. We've got one at the moment on dementia and another on independent living, which we're running with the uh, Danish Design Centre in partnership. But my parting shot is to give you what I would see as the sort of five key ingredients of these projects. The first is, and I think there's a lot of commonality with what other people have been saying, is you have to put design up front. This, our sort of design process that we use, the, what we call our double diamond, we tend to find that too often um, design starts here with an overdefined solution. And um, our role is often to help everybody see that actually you need to start with a whole new discovery and definitely design here is where actually you drive the innovation. Uh, the second is to stay open and um, these ideas and this thinking has only come because we've enabled a lot of different people to come together and share ideas and share thinking um, whilst also having good protocols to protect people's intellectual property on a journey. The third, and that's very much, I think, our role, is to provide a safe space, and that, we found, is incredibly important. Um, a place where manufacturers, policymakers, and others can come together and design, I believe, is a fantastic place for the generation of ideas and thinking. I suppose that's really what this is all about today. Um, and a brilliant way, then, to join up the experience, which is often poor, for users with the aspirations of policymakers, which are often light years ahead. Um, you might not want to, um, but, um, and they seem to be a distressed um, species at the moment, but, um, but we found that actually just like any good design project, the client's really important, and where politicians um, who are owning an individual problem through their ministry, um, take on board design, you can generate really great success. And actually, they are important to uh, developing design-led solutions. And finally, no compromises. And this is a picture. Actually, the, the, the final version is downstairs in the exhibition. This is Ben Delisi, the fashion designer. Um, and he's here at the Design Council demonstrating an early prototype of a new patient gown. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he's more used to um, designing for the catwalk and uh, for Kate Winslet at the Oscars. Um, and here he was developing new solutions for healthcare. Uh, and it was a really interesting combination. But what he did and others, other designers have done is really be very... Um, uh, you know, uncompromising in their whole approach. So that's it, really. The, hopefully, um, an insight, a quick insight, and a tour of how we see the role of design in not just um, uh, stimulating innovation or just nudging, but also how it can also have a wider economic benefit as well. <coughs> Thank you.